Hello, everyone. Uh, let me welcome everyone to this joint event uh, co organized by the Foundation for European Progressive Studies and the JAMA Marshall Fund of the United States. Um, my name is Vasilis Dusas. I'm the Senior International Relations Policy Advisor at FEPS. And uh, I, would like you to, I would like to thank you for joining us for what I believe will be a very interesting, very insightful discussion focusing um, on a very important topic, uh, which is transatlantic climate action. Uh, let me also say that this event forms part of the strategic partnership between FEPS and GMF that has been going on and going strong for uh, many years now. And of course, to extend my thanks to all colleagues who've been involved in preparing for this event and to our stellar panel of, uh, of speakers. Now, the, uh, I mean, it's obvious that the starting point of this discussion is the fact that there is new momentum, uh, new momentum in how both transatlantic partners, finally, um, how both of them perceive the nature of the problem at hand, the urgency of it, the science around it, and of course, to a great degree, what needs to be done to tackle it. Uh, this is undeniable, especially after the positive developments of last week, uh, in the EU, we had the adoption of the climate law, and we'll hear more about this um, in a moment or two. And in the US, we had the organization with some very important uh, concrete deliverables um, after the uh, uh, leaders summit that was organized. So the change and the momentum is undeniable and indeed very much welcome. But if the past has proven something, it, it, it's, it's that it's not simply about making optimum use or maximum use of this new momentum. Uh, I think it's clear that the kind of climate action we need uh, to avoid catastrophic dest destruction to our uh, habitats, to our biodiversity, to our planet, uh, requires that every single factor that needs to go well actually goes well from uh, um, uh, now on. So despite the momentum brought uh, forward by the Biden administration, I think it's safe to underline that the transatlantic partnership has to finally deliver in order to reconfirm its climate leadership. And uh, this is not just about any action taken together. This is a, a, a about just action taken that raises ambition and delivers outcome. And I'm sure everyone's cognizant of the daunting task ahead of us. Uh, in the US, not least because of the uh, deep partisan divides that exist. And in Europe, because of the need to ensure that member states, all member states deliver without asterisks. Uh, and also the need to guarantee that the policies and politics um, of the European Green Deal translate globally as well in a positive manner. So a critical issue, uh, critical timing, and that's why I'm very happy we have assembled this, uh, this great panel to help us explore how we get there. Uh, on this note, let me give the floor to uh, the discussion's excellent chair, Megan Richards, who's a, visit a visiting senior fellow at the GMF, who will moderate uh, today's discussion. And many thanks once again to everyone on the part of the organizers. And Megan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Vasilis, and welcome to everyone. Uh, we're looking very much forward to this discussion. As you said, it comes at a pivotal time just after uh, President Biden's Leaders Summit, which brought together 40 uh, heads of state and government, uh, very important timing as well, just before COP26. Uh, many of you have heard Sir David King say that we only have four or five years to really get this right and get things moving. We've been talking about it for 20 years. We really have to push now to get things moving. And as you said as well, Vasilis, the um, trilogues for the new EU climate law have just uh, been finalized. It's not in, in effect yet, that law, but of course the trilogues are finished just before uh, President Biden's climate summit. And so uh, it's really very good timing. So I want to call upon the members of our panel to introduce their issues and, and to get involved in this conversation. Uh, we have Ita Gutland, who is a Swedish member of the European Parliament, Parliament uh, David Livingston, who is State Department senior advisor and helping John Kerry uh, in moving forward on climate issues, 
Jacob Berksman, who's principal advisor in DG Climate Action in the European Commission, Nick Maybe, who is a chief executive of E3G and very much involved in COP26, and Alice Hill, who's a senior fellow for energy and environment at the Council of Foreign Relations. So let's get started. If I may, uh, Jutta Gutland, can I start with you? We've said, of course, that the new EU climate law has just finished the trilogues just before Earth Day. Uh, this is a very important step, but quite frankly, Europe already had some very good clean energy and climate legislation. Perhaps you can tell us how does the new climate law take things further? How is it going to make things different? And how do you see um, this driving forward the actions from each of the member states? Because as you know, uh, Europe is quite heterogeneous, particularly in the clean energy and climate change area. Go ahead. Thank you, Megan. And uh, thank you to the organizers for this uh, timely event. Uh, I believe for all of us who work with climate policy that uh, this is indeed a very exciting time. Things are happening and um, we have uh, better news uh, from the big uh, global uh, leaders in climate, also in front of uh, COP26. I believe that uh, we have a, a more uh, a better start this year than, than what we would have had last year or also in front of Madrid. Uh, I believe uh, this, this is a way much better situation the world has placed itself in. Um, that said, of course, I would like to, to start by uh, uh, answering the question that I got from Megan. And um, uh, I could say that uh, I was responsible for the, the report from the European Parliament on the climate law. And we are organized so that we have a team of negotiators. And I was the, the head of that uh, negotiating team from the European Parliament's uh, side. And we had a very strong mandate on this climate law uh, from the European Parliament uh, with ambitious proposals uh, on how we should uh, proceed. Uh, and I will short come back to that. But first of all, I would like to say that it is a very uh, big change that is happening in the European Union and uh, the European Green Deal is a transition and the growth program for Europe that is changing the way we work. And the climate law is the flagship of the European Green Deal. And this law, this regulation uh, is uh, historic because we are going from our history as a coal and steel union and for me, I come from Sweden, steel is really an important industry. Uh, and this is, this is the foundation of the European Union to cooperate on, on the coal and steel. And then we go towards a climate neutral Europe, at least in uh, the year 2050. So this is a historic transition that is uh, taking its beginning now and the climate law is is kind of the the flagship that will 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 steer us uh, all the way to the climate neutral europe so i like to point out that first uh, why is it uh, important why is the climate law relevant uh, how it differs from the sectorial legislation yes it does because it shows where we are going and it is regulation and it will be a law in all the member states in the end of this summer uh, after we voted uh, in both uh, the Council and the European Union, we will, we will have this regulation uh, in place in the end of the summer in, in, in the whole of the European Union. And of course, uh, this, this is very important because it shows both globally where we are going, well, what's our road towards the future, but it also is very predictable for our society and, and the sectors in our economy. Uh, everyone knows uh, where, what the target is and also where we are going. And we are also having intermediate targets, 2030, 2040, that will also steer uh, the ambition. 
uh, we uh, it, it will be predictable of course it will be re revised in the future well, hopefully well, i think we need to go even faster but this will mean that the industries of Europe will know where we need to be and all the sectorial legislation will know its place. So before I would say the sectorial legislation always were in this situation that they could blame each other and not find out what's our part of this. But now they will be part of this holistic climate law and they need to take their rightful part of, uh, of, of uh, cutting the emissions. And that said, I, I would like also uh, to mention that in this law that was ado adopted last week, we were continuing until 5 a.m. in the morning here in, in Brussels. That, so we had 14 hours of last trialogue together. But that was because Parliament insisted on several uh, more ambitious parts. And I think the Council will, in the end, find out that this was good. <laughs> uh, but we, we, we settled and agreed that we will also have better connection to science and to the Paris Agreement. Because, of course, we can be climate neutral 2050, but if we don't respect the Paris Agreement, we will still have cri cr climate crisis the year before that. Uh, we need to also be more ambitious to 2030. And what we did is that we, we introduced a greenhouse gas budget that will make uh, us more connected to the Paris Agreement and show where we are and what needs to be done. And that will be also presented at the same time as the Commission does its impact assessment on where we should be 2040. We also introduced this advisory board uh, with scientists uh, who will evaluate how the climate law is functioning towards its own targets, but also towards the Paris Agreement, how we actually function in the implementation of implement, ter, uh, implementary the, the Paris Agreement. So I really believe that we have connected science better to what we are doing in the European Parliament. And last but not least, I. I think at this moment that uh, the European Union is, uh, with its target to 2030, a very important leader in front of Glasgow this year. Uh, we will have a net reduction of 55% uh, to, to 2030. That is removals and reduction is, uh, that will, will give us that. But uh, we will also have, uh, we will also work with our uh, land and forest use and the emissions there. So we will even get a higher uh, target after this summer, I believe. The Commission will present when we adopt the climate law that we will go further when it comes to our removals. Uh, and thereby we will, we will approach uh, 57 in reduction uh, when we count even more removals in the in the Lulu CF regulation. And I think this is a clear signal also to, to the US, who is also more ambitious today, which is really great, uh, that the European Union is actually pushing even further. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad you mentioned some of those aspects, particularly relating to the United States, because uh, in a minute I want to come to uh, David Livingston to talk about uh, the outcome of the leader summit that uh, President Biden initiated uh, last week. My goodness, it seems already like a long time ago. And how you see, David, the European ambitions, which I think also because they're legislative, allow what I'm going to call regulatory pull for innovation and development and require member states, industry, and others to meet those uh, criteria. Perhaps you can give us an idea from the US side, how you see the American take on the outcome of the uh, leader summit and also what the US will do in addition to the many aspects that President Biden has already taken on his very first days in, in office. By the way, before I come to you, David, just one small thing there is a possibility for participants to ask questions and you can do this through the Q&A function. So if you just write them in there uh, when we've had our first round 
and how the discussion between the panelists will be able to come to those. So David, can I pass you the floor to talk about uh, the takeaways from the Leader Summit and also, of course, how you see improved cooperation uh, between um, the European Union and, well, let's include Europe because we also have the UK here um, and the United States and, of course, multilateral cooperation in general. Absolutely. Thank, thank you very much, Megan. Um, and uh, thanks to GMF for, for putting this together and for, for having me. Um, let me actually, you know, sandwich kind of a, a briefing on the takeaways from the summit with, with, a, with a couple of remarks on the transatlantic relationship, uh, not only at the end, but also at the outset, because I think that's very important. Um, you know, I, I want to underscore in, in no uncertain terms that the United States comes you know, uh, back to the stage, reasserting climate leadership from a position of being deeply uh, humble and appreciative and grateful for the Herculean efforts of the European Union over the past several years to move ahead this agenda. Um, uh, oftentimes when it was a, a, a solitary or a, um, you know, a, a more lonely voice on these issues in a um, in an even you know, more uncertain and perhaps kind of chaotic uh, global environment when it comes to climate cooperation. Um, that's not easy and we don't take that for granted and we're deeply, deeply grateful for that. And going forward, uh, you know, we welcome continued EU leadership on climate. A great demonstration of that is in the, is in the, you know, the finalization of the climate law just days before uh, the summit. Um, a terrific signal, not only about climate ambition, but also about the action uh, and the steps needed to follow through on that ambition. Um, and I think it, it sets a really strong example and, and, and it sent a strong message uh, about the path that the EU has, um, has, has blazed in this, in this regard and lessons that others could take away um, and, and follow and aspire to. Um, the Biden administration from day one has been fully committed as you know, to addressing the climate crisis. I mean, on the, one of the very first actions after, after President Biden walked into the Oval Office was to submit the instrument to rejoin the Paris Agreement. Um, now, having done that, uh, you know, we also prioritize developing um, a new 2030 uh, NDC for, for Paris um, that would be much more ambitious than the existing US NDC, and which would be in line with keeping, as Secretary Kerry is fond of saying, 1.5 alive, keeping the 1.5 degree C goal uh, within reach. Because simply aiming for two degrees C, we're increasingly told by the most up-to-date science is insufficient and won't be acceptable, particularly to some of the most vulnerable countries and populations out there. So we are committed to bringing forward an NDC consistent with that uh, keeping 1.5 degrees C within reach, joining the European Union in, in catching up to, to a position of, of climate leadership and a bold ambition to put us in a greater position to work together and to coordinate coming out of the summit. Um, and then also to use the summit to, to really try and bring together, uh, in particular, other like-minded countries, uh, to bring them up to a similar place so that we had a, uh, as common a platform as possible with as much of global GDP as possible amongst like-minded like countries to go forward over the rest of this year in the lead up to Glasgow and be able to sort of walk shoulder to shoulder with a common vision, a common direction, a common pace and cadence as to, to the greatest degree possible. Um, now, in terms of uh, the summit itself, um, I mean, first of all, it's important to keep it in context. It was an ambitious and at times even uncertain undertaking the largest virtual gathering of world leaders, um, reconvening the major economies forum on energy and climate, which uh, comprises the world's 17 largest economies and also greenhouse gas emitters, um, uh, but also including a wide ar array of other leaders of other countries. And in particular, those vulnerable to climate impacts or those charting despite for in many cases their small size, charting innovative pathways to net zero. So we wanted to have others at the table as well, not just the major economies, but those that remind us of why 
uh, anything short of aspiring to keep 1.5 degrees C in reach is unacceptable. S small island states, vulnerable economies, et cetera, as well as those that are reminding us that further ambition is possible, that solutions can be developed regardless of the size of an economy, regardless of the number of emissions at home. We all have a role in cooperating to develop climate solutions. That was the ethos of the summit. Um, for, the, for us in the United States, it was also a, a signal across the US government. President Biden was joined not just by Secretary Kerry, not just by domestic, uh, you know, our domestic climate czar, Gina McCarthy, not just by EPA Administrator Michael Reagan, but is joined by members of the president's cabinet across the board, Department of Transportation, Department of Defense, um, U.S. Trade Representative's Office. I mean, this was also meant to send a signal across government and from across government to the world that this is a whole of government effort and that climate is not just one priority amongst many, it is a priority that bleeds into all others. Um, and on, you see that, by the way, also in the, in the largest, uh, you know, uh, green spending package in history, which has been put forward. The president's $2 trillion uh, uh, you know, infrastructure plan, the American's job plan, uh, which would have significant spending uh, as a down payment on getting us towards that enhanced uh, NDC. It would see the United States cut, uh, you know, emissions 50% um, to 52% below 2005 levels by 2030. Um, we're pleased with the outcome. We're pleased with what this renewed sense of uh, uh, prioritization of the climate issue in the in U.S. diplomacy and some very active diplomatic efforts in the in the sprint of less than 100 days to the summit. We're, we're, we're satisfied with the, with the fruits that has yielded so far. And just to remind, um, Japan announced that they would cut emissions 46% to 50% below 2013 levels by 2030, uh, with very strong efforts towards achieving a 50% reduction, which is a quite significant acceleration, almost a doubling from its existing 26% reduction goal. Similarly, our, our, our neighbor Canada strengthened its, strengthened its NDC to a 40 to 45% reduction from 2005 levels uh, by 2030, which is a significant increase over its previous emissions target of 30% below 2005 levels. So again, a, a very significant, in, significant increase there. India had a very constructive uh, engagement at the summit, reiterating its target of 450 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2030, which we believe incidentally is one of the most important goals for India to reach to keep it on the pathway uh, to net zero emissions by 2050. In other words, if India can achieve that, um, it's not going to be so difficult to get it onto that net zero 2050 trajectory. And it won't be that difficult, um, or it will be easier. We'll have a clearer glide path to getting India on a pathway consistent with keeping 1.5 degrees C within reach, which is obviously to the benefit, not just of the United States, the EU, but to India and indeed the entire world. Um, and to that end, we've put together a US-India 2030 Climate Clean Energy Agenda Partnership, um, which is aimed at uh, helping India with the tools necessary um, to indeed deliver on that 450 gigawatt uh, renewables target. Argentina announced that it would strengthen its NDC um, Republic of Korea announced it would strengthen its NDC this year. It also announced that it would terminate public overseas coal finance. Um, China indicated, uh, you know, suggested strict control of coal-fired power generation projects. Of course, the, um, uh, that will be closely watched to see whether uh, actions meet words and to see if that rhetoric lives up to its potential. And it will be important to scrutinize that, you know, very closely. Um, in addition, uh, we saw South Africa announcing that it intends to strengthen its NDC. Brazil committed to achieve net zero by 2050 to end illegal deforestation by 2030. Again, we're encouraged by these sorts of positive statements, by this positive engagement at the summit. We also don't take these things purely at face value. Um, the, the words are relatively inexpensive. Um, actions are hard fought, hard earned. And in order to truly uh, stand up as climate leaders, countries, including the United States, 
including, including the EU, including Brazil, Russia, China, others, will need to have actions that live up to their rhetoric. Um, now, we also had sessions that highlighted uh, various different aspects of our shared climate challenges, our shared climate opportunities, from finance to adaptation, to the economic opportunities of a transition that delivers prosperity, dignity, and opportunity for workers, um, uh, and as well as a focus on innovation and the innovative business models, technologies, tools, solutions that will be brought to bear to help deliver faster progress towards net zero 2050 and faster progress towards ambitious uh, actions to 2030 that are consistent with that net zero 2050 1.5 degrees C goal. Um, I will just note, uh, without going into the details of all of these sessions, for MEP uh, Gutland, who, who highlighted uh, the importance of steel, um, I'm proud to say that we featured uh, Vattenfall to talk about the, uh, the, the hybrid solution or the hybrid uh, coalition that's been brought together to help work on green steel solutions that we're very excited about. Um, it, it was, we meant this to be a summit that did not just highlight American solutions, but indeed global solutions, um, and, and highlighted the fact that we can all grow the economic pie uh, together, um, and that will create jobs not only for the United States, uh, but also opportunities for, for like-minded countries around the world that are, that are in step with us. Um, so with that being said, you know, let, me, let me just circle back and reiterate how I opened, which is, with the United States now at the forefront of several other countries that are all committed to keeping 1.5 degrees C within reach, and that all have 1.5 C aligned NDCs, we together, the United States, the EU, Japan, Canada, the UK, et cetera, we together collectively now represent close to 50% of global GDP, if not slightly over 50% of global GDP, depending on how you count it. That is a critical mass to go forward, less than 100 days in the Biden-Harris administration to move forward now in lockstep with our partners, our allies, um, like-minded countries around the world in doing the rest of the hard work that needs to be done with the G7 ahead of us, with the G20 ahead of us on the road to Glasgow um, and to continue raising ambition The summit was not a destination. The summit is not the terminal point on this journey. The summit was was a opportunity to catalyze US efforts, to catalyze a whole of government approach, um, and to demonstrate the world that we are serious about climate, not just at home within the United States, but also about being a responsible leader internationally. There's perhaps no greater partner in that effort than the EU, no more natural partner in that than the EU. Um, And we really look forward now to coming out of the summit to working together, not just on transatlantic opportunities for decarbonization, climate ambition, climate action, but perhaps even more importantly on what we can do together to help bend the arc of emissions in the rest of the world, uh, where there's still quite a bit of work to do um, in the months leading up to Glasgow. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, David. I'm glad you mentioned that at the, your, at the end of your intervention, because this, I think, is really where we have to move forward. Uh, certainly in Europe, we all breathed a sigh of relief when President Biden was elected from a climate perspective, clean energy perspective. And of course, when he indicated that he, the United States would rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement. But I think where we need to move forward, and this is what I want to come to Jacob on, is working together with other countries around the world, not just transatlantically, but transatlantic multilateral uh, to encourage and help and use technology transfer, new innovative solutions to encourage other countries to move forward. You've seen in the United States and certainly in Europe, we've seen it that this clean energy transition comes with new and good jobs, something that President Biden has underline. So Jacob, can I come to you now on how you see the EU-US cooperation and collaboration on encouraging other countries to move forward, as well as, of course, the, let's call it, usual transatlantic cooperation on on this issue, and what are the implications for COP26, as well as future climate actions? Well, thanks, thanks very much, Megan, and thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to, to join the panel. 
uh, and and to meet uh, some some new colleagues as well as to see some some old friends on on, on the panel. Uh, maybe just to to start with a bit of historical perspective. Um, uh, I've been involved in this process uh, for almost three decades now, maybe a little over. Uh, and so it's it's thirty years of a, of a transatlantic relationship in in trying to come to a a global solution that can actually address I think what the science told us was a um, a, a very um, uh, in, intimidating challenge, even even when the process started in the in the early 1990s. Uh, and so um, I think as, as everyone would admit as the perhaps the steadier uh, of the two partners in in that relationship over those three decades, it's um, it's wonderful to have the US back, uh, as David said, uh, by our side and 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 as um, being described by that partner in such flattering terms, I'm very much appreciated to know that the efforts that we've been making uh, haven't been taken for granted and uh, and that it, uh, uh, our commitment, not just to, to climate change as an issue, but to multilateralism as the, as the, the best uh, way of addressing it uh, is, is being appreciated at, uh, at this stage. Um, we also look forward to, to now walking side by side with the US to Glasgow, but hopefully for, for many years to come. Uh, and uh, uh, I think we, we, we all need to, to take that, that longer term perspective on what this relationship could, could evolve into, uh, hopefully at a faster and faster pace, um, first hand in hand, but then perhaps uh, competing with each other in, the, in our, our race to, uh, to zero as, as it's been characterized, uh, zero emissions, um, perhaps throwing a, an occasional sharp elbow at each other as we, we each tell our, our populations, our, our our, our businesses, um, our citizens, that we want to be the first movers, uh, that we want to um, be the, uh, the, 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 uh, at the head of the curve in terms of competing for the, for the jobs, the innovation, the technologies that will shape this, uh, this, this net zero future that we're moving towards, but, but um, uh, nonetheless uh, working, working more, more closely together. I think as, as we approach this opportunity, um, first of all, we, we want to sort of throw some compliments back. Uh, I mean, what, what the Biden administration was able to achieve in the first 100 days has been very impressive, uh, particularly the exercise of that, uh, the diplomatic skill of the convening power, um, that, that bully pulpit that um, is, is not just heard in the United States, but around the world. It, it's truly been impressive. Uh, and we really wanted to, to thank the US for that effort. Um, the, the early harvest of, of some of the plans that uh, Canada and Japan, uh, Korea had, um, had in, in train for the Glasgow summit, I think will be really helpful in terms of keeping the pressure on uh, those uh, major economies that haven't yet delivered. And that's something that uh, I, I want to, to say a few words about uh, as well. Um, but I think that the way in which we, we see the, the opportunity in the near term comes in a, in a couple of different categories. Um, the first is essentially how we begin to deepen the partnership with regard to the next steps. Um, targets are one thing um, and they're incredibly important, but it really is that implementing policy that uh, Yitta referred to as, as being the, the, um, the lifeblood uh, of, of um, action, but also of, of cooperation on climate change. Uh, as, as you have properly characterized it, the, the climate law is, is the flagship, but the cargo on board that, that flagship is going to be the policies that we begin to roll out uh, towards the end of June, what we call the Fit for 55 package, where you will see how it is that as the EU, um, with, uh, with the Commission's proposals coming forward, we intend to, to implement that uh, across the board of our, um, our emissions trading system, our renewable energy policy, energy efficiency, in, in traditional sectors like industry and, and energy production, but also in sectors that we really have to, to learn how to do better in, in terms of improving the, the energy efficiency of building uh, buildings, um, electri electrification of the transport sector, uh, really pushing hard on the way in which our land and land use change and forestry can contribute to, to capturing emissions. Um, all of this is, is gonna begin to be ro rolled out with, with even more um, momentum behind it than we've had in the, in the past decade and a half or so of getting our emissions under control. And I think that's where we're looking for, where can our policies create deeper opportunities for cooperation uh, and 
virtual competition in driving using the sizes of our economy to drive uh, the rest of the global economy in in the same same direction and that runs everything from uh, things that we've collaborated on the past in terms of setting uh, energy efficiency standards automobile standards uh, in in those markets that uh, we we already have competitive edges um, developing the new technologies in terms of hydrogen and and zero emissions heavy, heavy industry uh, steel has already been mentioned as a, as a place in which we, we, we can cooperate, but also in, in innovative uh, policies like um, the, the border carbon adjustment measure that will be part of that uh, 55, a 55 package that will come out in June and where we know the US administration um, also has some interest in exploring the way in which you can use trade measures in a way um, to make sure that uh, the efforts that you're taking at home um, aren't uh, somehow how lost uh, uh, globally through uh, through uh, uh, trade relationships. So um, that's the first category of, of, of uh, deepening cooperation is that that working together in understanding how we're addressing through specific policies these ambitious targets that we've set for ourselves. The second, and and you touched upon this in your um, in your question, Megan, is is how can we work through the multilateral system to bring others on board. Uh, that's obviously cooperation in Paris uh, through this sort of diplomacy of ambition that we're we're working on at the moment um, in terms of uh, uh, raising raising the ambition of targets, the long term strategies, the net zero commitments. Um, but it's also all the partnerships um, that previous administrations uh, have have worked together with the EU on uh, mission innovation. Uh, for for example, you know, how is it that we can we can bring together our investments in research and innovation uh, to to create the next breakthrough technologies? Um, these were partnerships that we built together um, under previous administrations, and that I think now we're all committed to reviving. So those sort of um, uh, partnerships, I think, are are going to be key as well. But also outside of the Paris Agreement process, um, working together in other multilateral settings, um, whether it's the the WTO. Uh, it's the FAO, it's the OECD, uh, with, with our uh, work combined with, with US efforts, uh, the opportunities to reform uh, and, and focus uh, these multilateral institutions, um, the, the multilateral development banks uh, on uh, coming on board with Paris alignment as well as uh, those opportunities I think are, are really um, uh, limitless. And then finally, uh, I think the third area of cooperation is in what we refer to as kind of triangulating uh, with key uh, third third party party countries. Um, uh, even as the US was preparing for the climate summit last week, uh, the EU is moving forward with the various summits that we have regularly with um, other major economies, um, uh, including importantly, India uh, and China and Brazil. And of course, um, with, with Italy uh, running the, the G20 process this year and the UK on the G7 process, using those forums as well uh, to make sure that, that major economies are, are raising their level of ambition. That's something that I think that uh, we need to, to work uh, more, more uh, carefully uh, together on to make sure that they're, they're hearing similar messages in terms of what our expectations are, but also we're combining the forces of uh, our ability to mobilize capital, uh, both um, uh, public capital, but also private capital to create the right incentives um, in, in these countries uh, and, and also in the countries that they work with. Um, uh, I, I know that there are some initial conversations about uh, how we can work together, for example, to encourage China to, um, to green uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, through its investments around the world. I think that's something that uh, the US uh, and the EU working together on can, can be uh, much more effective with regard to. So um, let, let, me, let me stop there to say that, uh, you know, fantastic to have the US by our side, uh, hoping that the, the US politics will continue to, to support this first 100 days uh, as, as um, uh, the administration inevitably turns to Congress to help, uh, but also as we cycle through uh, the the upcoming uh, elections um, that uh, that that level of, of commitment will will um, sustain itself uh, over time uh, and uh, and we can help um, uh, address this incredibly important challenge together. Thanks. Great. 
Thank you very much, Jacob. Uh, and I'm glad you mentioned the uh, mission innovation. There are many others, G20, G7, uh, clean energy ministerials, etc. because Alicia Winkle has asked a question about cooperation with other countries and um, creating an EU-US initiated climate club, but there are many of these that exist. So I think you've already addressed some of them. And of course, we'll come back to carbon border adjustment uh, mechanisms and other things later. So let me go on now then to Nick Maybe. And Nick, I wanted again in this context of the G7, COP27, uh, of course, uh, the G20, which Jacob rightly said is led by Italy this year. Uh, the G7 is meeting is coming up in June. The COP26 is, of course, officially a joint project between the UK and Italy, but the UK doesn't mention that very often. <laughs> it takes place in Glasgow, of course. So perhaps you could give us an idea of the kind of uh, concrete outcomes that you see coming out of COP26 and perhaps also the G7. Will there be things specifically in the context of the G7 that the UK is thinking of addressing? It's the timing would be right, I suppose. Uh, and can do you see how these activities and the US, um, EU, UK leaders can, can jointly galvanize the new NDCs and make sure that they're real commitments. Right, and thanks so much for the opportunity to speak. It's good to see some old friends um, on the call, but also um, to be speaking positively about how much more we can achieve in a year rather than um, risk managing another international climate crisis, which has been a bit too much the last few years. Um, I'm going to try and be more specific and think about how climate fits into the broader pace and how we actually deliver the aspiration of more transformational action by Glasgow that keeps 1.5 within reach, which will be very difficult because we also expect the science to be slightly worse this year and to make 1.5 even harder. So I think we should all be realistic. And without, I think my take on the Biden summit was it was great in that it showed that we had the potential to, to do more, but to grasp that opportunity was going to take a really significant diplomatic and political lift, which um, is much harder in the world of Zoom, to be honest, because um, Zoom diplomacy is very poor dividends, you don't get the human factor in the way you do. And that's not a trivial part of this game. So I was going to cover three main points. Firstly, you know, what are the things that the transatlantic cooperation needs to really rapidly accelerate to get us to Glasgow? So what is, what's the critical path? There's lots of things we could do. What do we have to do? Secondly, how do we make sure climate fits into the broader geopolitical context of this year? We can't ignore the fact that most of the world is going through a COVID crisis and a deep economic crisis and the fragmentation in the world is still very strong geopolitically and economically and climate can't sit in as the Chinese would put it a, a, a warm greenhouse while there is snow outside though they use that in a slightly different context um, and finally what do we do beyond Glasgow we've got to go into Glasgow we've got to make Glasgow work but then what's beyond and how does how do we use the transatlantic relationship beyond Glasgow so firstly so I think the summit, the Biden summit was a great step forward, gave us an indication, but to be honest, I think it also shows the limitations of US unilateral diplomacy in a, in a multipolar world. The, the power dynamics of the world has moved on. You know, the changes with South Korea and Japan, huge amounts of European and UK diplomacy went in there as well. To be honest, um, we didn't get as much as we were hoping, for example, on Japanese coal finance and other areas. Um, yes, they may come later in the year, but it, it was striking to me that usually the first summit a US president held is one of their biggest kind of diplomatic carrots. And I thought, you know, it shows that we got a lot of work to do. It's quite sticky, this issue, because we're asking for big decisions. So again, that's just a, a reflection on the world. The most disappointing thing for me was the World Bank's climate plan. There was a huge amount of diplomacy thrown at the World Bank by Europe, by the UK, by US. I didn't think it moved as much as it needs to go. And it shows, I think, the need for more concerted, aligned and high level action. And that's if we really want to get the changes this fast, we really are pushing hard. So three areas um, I think we need for Glasgow, particularly for the G7. Firstly, um, to get the attention, to get the permission to talk about climate, we need to move on the major debt fiscal space 
and recovery programs for developing countries and, and vulnerable countries. We just can't, we're not even getting an opening in these conversations without that. And vaccine diplomacy is part of that. So there's a kind of contextual economic and vaccine issues that have to be dealt with. Um, secondly, I think the a really strong joint approach to green recovery, including monitoring that, and the EU's done some really interesting work here. The UK is a bit of a back marker, to be honest. Um, Japan's a bit of a back marker. The Biden plan is a really interesting part to show that the kind of overwhelming weight of capital and investment is starting to go into green and that and taking that to the G20. And that's the link Italy's trying to forge. So that's a really powerful. So we go into Glasgow with a tsunami of finance going into green for the recovery. Um, and the last one is a major package from the G7 on climate financing. That is the alignment of like getting rid of fossil financing for as many public banks as we possibly can. Um, as soon as has not just coal, but that's also limiting oil and gas majorly. Upscaling their finance, they need more money, both for COVID and climate. And there's some clever ways of doing that with their balance sheets. It does not actually, but we also need to pay the public finance bill. The 100 billion is becoming a huge sticking point in terms of the politics of this, even though it's not the largest amount of money. But I think that's also, we need to think of how do we give clear offers to countries who at the Biden summit said they would come off coal and onto clean if they had access to finance, which currently the COVID recession is stopping them having. India is the biggest, obviously, but also Pakistan that did a moratorium on coal last year. Bangladesh, who's told China it doesn't want any more coal financing. South Africa, who's got a plan for winding down coal but also countries wanting to invest in resilience and nature. So there's, there's some tangible deals we need to do and work together as a G7 to do, because nobody can do it on their own. So I think that's the, that's the critical G7 path for me. Um, but also we need to put it in a broader context. We can't build a climate global action if the rest of geopolitics isn't working. And again, I think the, the really, really powerful piece of diplomacy you're adding up to the summit was the relationship with China. We started off the year with some quite kind of spicy dis relationships between US and China, on, including on climate change. And I think the fact that she turned up and gave a positive speech with indications of potential movement was a real diplomatic coup and kind of gave us the geopolitical space to do more. And I think it shows the convergence between the US, the UK and the EU on the kind of the framework of how to handle climate change in what will continue to be a very difficult geopolitical environment. You know, no trade-offs with human rights. And, uh, and speaking out hard on difficult issues. Um, cooperate and align mainly through multilateral approaches, no G2s. Um, and also being clear about the economic competition for the clean economy, but saying that's gonna be, be handled on a level playing field defined by rules and China can be part of writing those rules. And I think that is a stable approach to take it in a very unstable time. And that will inform rulemaking beyond the UNFCCC, the WTO, the IMF is making some really serious rules this year. Um, the finance system rules, taxonomy, digital governance, all areas which we need to solve to build a climate economy. But, and China is gonna be in those debates. Um, but I think, and it's been mentioned before that the, the hole we've got in the international geopolitics at the moment is our relationship with developing countries and the vulnerable countries. The EU did a climate and development ministerial at the end of March. It was very clear they didn't feel heard, they feel hurt, and they have got real difficult domestic issues. And we need to um, rebuild discussions around areas like loss and damage. They're not, it can't be off limits to discuss these issues. And I think the UK has laid out a, a promise to the vulnerable countries that the, their issues will be in the G7, the G20, at the IMF banks. And that's something which I think Europe and the US have to work in harmony with, because if we lose them, then it's going to be a discussion at Glasgow about finance, not about climate ambition. And that's my fear. That's where things were going at the moment in that kind of tension. Um, and the good way is if we do it properly, then we drive, we use climate to drive more cooperation and more rules-based approaches, which is good for our broader geopolitics. So I think there's a real prize here to make climate the center of cooperation rather than a source of tension. And the final area is kind of what do we do beyond Glasgow? So um, I know it's not something that David will be able to say, but let's say in Europe and elsewhere, um, a two year or four year US presidency, I mean, US presidency has been pretty volatile on climate issues over the last, and multilateralism over the last few decades. And there is a real issue about how to plan 
and in potential reversals in US politics. And that's just being honest. But I think that's why we should focus on building and having a very advanced and prioritized plan for how do we build some of those rules coming out and going out of Glasgow, we really look at how do we shape the global context so it can't be reversed. Um, and that means we not focus on a proactive plan rather than on, there's lots of things we could argue about across the Atlantic, gas, CBAMs, Buy America, Nord Stream 2, digital governance. Those are all deep, you know, and we need to tackle those, but we should prioritize how do we climate proof the UN Security Council, the humanitarian system and the world food security system? How do we make trade rules accelerate climate, not just be a bystander? How do we build a public and private system, finance system that's pretty Farris aligned? And so I think that that's about an agenda that's deeply structural, focuses on what we agree on, doesn't, doesn't avoid the this arguments, but makes the, it puts the political energy behind meaning in two, four years time, we've got a totally different rules-based system that is aligned with climate. And I think that is the way we both win and also make change sticky, which is quite important for investor confidence. So I think if we had coming out of Glasgow, a kind of North, a transatlantic, kind of green economy zone building in terms of bilateral relationships, but also that being turned into a global framework for, for change, that would start to keep 1.5 within reach. So when we get to the next iteration of Paris in 2025, every country thinks it's worth being net zero by 2050, because otherwise their economy is going to be out of, out of jobs and out of competitiveness. Thank you. Great, thanks, Nick. And of course, uh, in the context of developing countries, many of them have huge potential for new leapfrogging technologies to start new clean energy initiatives, which will benefit their citizens dramatically and help them come out uh, of these economic difficulties that they've gone through because of the pandemic. They need, of course, also the green financing to go with it. And I'm glad that you mentioned uh, the importance of China and the uh, relationship uh, <laughs> that we all have with China. And I want to bring in Alice Hill now on this in particular. Alice, not specifically on China, but in the context of domestic relations within the United States, China comes up in almost every conversation, even in domestic politics in the United States, uh, whether it be on intellectual property or tech or uh, trade, uh, in the context of climate as well. And of course, during the last four years in particular, between the EU and the United States, we had many, many relations with regional uh, state city uh, governors, I'm going to call them with a small G, not the governor of the state, but uh, the, those responsible for those uh, particular areas. And they have such an important role to play here. I wanted you to give us an idea of how these uh, more regional or state or local actors can work together with their partners in the transatlantic uh, context, but also around the world to help drive forward these climate uh, goals. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Megan. And thank you uh, to my esteemed panelists. I just am very honored to have the chance to join this. So thanks to the organizers for putting this together. Obviously a very important topic uh, and one that has been the focus in the United States and worldwide, all eyes on whether the United States can be trusted again after four years of absence. Uh, our state and local and uh, some tribal authorities, as you've mentioned, Megan, were active during the years when the Trump administration was busily dismantling the progress the Obama administration had made on climate. Uh, and going forward, those ties and opportunities will remain. Uh, there we see a lot of action at the state and local level, uh, demands for further greening of the United States. Those mostly occur in a very polarized nation. And we just have to be uh, truthful that this question of whether the United States can be trusted will hang over this relationship going forward in my opinion. Unfortunately, the most recent polling of the split in the United States was a little disconcerting. Uh, a Gallup poll just conducted uh, this month revealed that 82% of Democrats believe that the effects of global warming are already occurring, but only 29% of Republicans believe so. 
That poll taken in 2001 showed just a 13% split between the parties, and now we're 53 points apart. And then we have a deeply divided Congress uh, with one uh, Democratic senator holding a lot of power, and he comes, of course, from coal country in West Virginia. So those dynamics are very real for the Biden administration going forward. Uh, whether they can be overcome uh, will hang over as a cloud, but we have a, a, a few things working in our favor. Um, I will say, in, I worked at the Hoover Institution, which is a center-right institution. I follow what uh, my former colleagues do on climate change as well as uh, more conservative uh, mainstream media, it's still, there's still doubt over out there about whether we need to act on climate. Uh, and that's deep within the Republican party. Uh, so we're seeing, uh, for example, the Wall Street Journal just featured yesterday uh, a review of a book by uh, a physicist. He did work in the Obama administration questioning whether we need to act. Uh, and we, yes, so it, it is uh, some, and a colleague of mine from, former colleague from Hoover told Congress, we don't need to act. So we have a lot of noise happening in the Republican party, but I don't wanna say that there isn't uh, hope here. Uh, first of all, in my experience, particularly in the last six months, we've seen the private sector step up in the United States in a way they never have before. More net zero promises, more uh, action at the boards, more calls for greater ambition by everyone. What's behind those promises remains uh, a question, and we haven't been able to look under the hood to see if what, what's uh, going to actually drive net zero. But there is interest in a way that uh, was not palpable uh, just uh, a little while ago. The other thing that we're seeing is the youth. And that's where the bright light is for Republicans uh, in terms of action on climate. The polling shows that uh, 18 to 29 year olds are far more supportive of, of action on climate. So if we can keep seeing those numbers increase as we get more voting age, uh, young, young people uh, who have the vote and who are motivated to act on climate, that could drive the politics here locally as well as uh, on the uh, national stage. We also have uh, the overlay of social justice, which has been uh, obviously an issue for the United States in the last uh, years. And I think that will also drive further action on climate. There's much greater recognition that justice uh, across the globe, these impacts fall mostly or harder on the most vulnerable. That's true on our disadvantaged communities and our uh, historically discriminated against communities here in the United States. So they're on the front lines here, they're on the front lines across the globe. And so there's better appreciation that we will have to address those issues as well uh, to make sure that there are better outcomes for all. And then sadly uh, for everyone, the impacts are becoming more evident. Uh, last year in the midst of a pandemic, uh, 2020. The United States along our eastern seaboard, along our Atlantic, had 30 named storms, so many named storms that the meteorologists had to turn to the Greek alphabet to name them. And then on our western side of the United States, we had such big wildfires, 10 million acres burned, that we got an entirely new vocabulary word, a gigafire, where a fire burns more than a million acres. We saw in the very aptly named Death Valley, the, probably the highest ever reliably recorded temperature in the world, 130 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. I don't know how to translate that in Celsius, but I know it's really, really hot. Uh, and it's, uh, so we are seeing extremes, including flooding. And I do think that also because uh, it serves as a prompt for greater action. So uh, yes, we will see a lot of um, promises made by states and local communities, but those often reflect the split in our country along party lines. This is an issue for the Democrats. The Republicans have not in any meaningful way embraced climate change. In fact, uh, I've, I've been asked to do debates 
uh, with on a partisan basis, representing the Democrats and then trying to get a Republican. But it's very difficult to have a, uh, a debate because the Republican Party hasn't put forward any more meaningful plans on climate change. Some of it's still debating whether it's occurring, as we're seeing from some of these uh, recent statements. So uh, I remain hopeful. I think the Biden administration has done everything they can to uh, prove uh, after a nasty breakup on the very first date back that uh, they're going to be aiming for a lot greater uh, communication and improvement in the relationship. And I, I'm confident that that will continue. I share uh, Nick's concern that we in the United States have to up our game on ambition for finance and also addressing these impacts that are coming into the least developed countries and the most vulnerable countries, particularly in the wake of the pandemic. They are suffering uh, huge uh, economic stress and they're already in debt. Uh, we've got to figure out a way to help them thrive and reach their goals. And that will mean much more money going forward, much more financing being available to have that be successful. Uh, and, and also domestically, the United States will have to up its game on its own adaptation preparation. And those will be to-do lists for the Biden administration. So in some, there's hope, uh, but it's always cautious because uh, we have a divided nation. And until we can work through that and have people appreciate what's at stake with climate change, uh, the Biden administration will have to pedal even harder uh, than many other places around the world to accomplish what it needs to accomplish in climate change. Thank you very much, Alice. I mean, it's, it's an issue that affects Democrats and Republicans equally. That, as you know. So perhaps it's an issue that the country can eventually come around together on. I mean, I think it was Nixon who established the Environmental Protection Agency. Yes. George Bush was active in establishing wind turbines in, in Texas. So there is potentially hope there too. And it's not to suggest either that Europe, whereas Yita uh, is entirely uh, uniform, as I said at the beginning, it's also very heterogeneous. So we're going to also have if not the same, many similar uh, challenges in Europe. And uh, Yita, I wanted to come back to you specifically on how you think the different countries in the different member states, I, sh I suppose I should say officially, in the European Union will react to the um, new climate law. You mentioned, of course, how the, you expect the Council to agree, but then the member states, of course, will have to implement. And one of the questions that was raised in the chat here by Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous was about the accountability measures that will be included in the climate law to ensure cooperation of member states. So would you mind coming in on that? And I saw that you had a future European in your room as well, which is always nice to see. Yes, it's my son. He's home a bit early from, from Maternel here. Um, but I, <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Uh, but. I would like to start by saying that um, I expect the council to uh, to adopt this and uh, the same for the parliament. I believe that we have done our work to secure that. But uh, then, of course, uh, there are uh, there are obstacles. Uh, but before I, 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 I uh, come to them, I would like to say that since this is a regulation, it will be um, law in the member states and it's it's not the same as a directive where we need to implement it and it can look different in the different member states but that said since this is more the flagship the road the targets the the tricky part will be how to make the member states obey to this and do it in reality with all the sectorial legislation and then also uh, member states to also uh, adapt to this uh, climate neutrality for each member state, not only on the member uh, on the EU level, but make sure that each member state is also climate neutral at the latest 2050. Uh, that is something that we have pointed to as a weak part in the climate law. Uh, we would have wanted it to be also binding element for the member states. Uh, and there we had some member states who were not uh, willing to, to, to agree to that. And therefore we didn't have the, the, the majority in the, uh, in the 
in the council, or at least there was enough resistance to 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 make the council uh, agree to it. Uh, but that said, I think what's important, and uh, I believe also Jacob uh, were speaking about it, it's also the sectorial legislation. We have this. Uh, <clears throat> a, 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 um, a uh, baby who is popular has many names. We have the June package, the Fit for 55 or 57 package, the 2030 package. Yeah, it's all it's the same. But we have the sectorial legislation coming up this summer, and we will see that the Commission is uh, is uh, giving us uh, the proposal for how the different uh, sectors should abate the climate law and reduce its emissions accordingly. And we will see how they present this. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the ETS reform is extremely important. Uh, I believe that that is one of the most important sectorial legislation there is, and also probably in the world, one of the strongest climate uh, laws uh, that is there. And uh, I would really like the ETS to, to be um, connected, uh, of course, to the target for 2030 and make sure that we have a greater, uh, that we phase out uh, more emissions every year. There is a linear reduction uh, to how, how, how that should be done in this market-based uh, 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 law. Uh, and I, I want this to be steeper. And that will be one of the discussions, how steep sh shall it be? And then also, um, I believe it's important also that we uh, incorporate the more international um, businesses in, into the, the climate uh, law. And uh, one is, uh, of course, the maritime sector. And today we, we don't have proper uh, legislation, climate legislation, Yes, we have on reporting on the emissions, but we don't have how to reduce and targets for, for how much uh, it should be reduced and also proper legislation to deal with that when it comes to the CO2 emissions. And I believe uh, we need to do that. So I hope that the Commission will present something this summer that will make the European Union go uh, further. And uh, that would also on the, on the international level be uh, leadership. And I saw in the questions in the Q&A that uh, there was a question about leadership, why leadership is so important. Uh, and yes, it is. I don't think it is possible actually to, to show the world that others need to act if you don't act yourself and if you don't implement proper uh, legislation in your own house. How can you... Uh, how can you uh, push others to, to do something that is uh, more, especially the US and, uh, and, and um, the European Union, we have a special responsibility since we emitted for so long. Uh, and, and we have a very global responsibility what's been done his historically. And I actually heard in the, in, when I was in, uh, in Poland, in Katowice, um, I remember how some, countries were referring to the United States and said, if they are not willing, then we are not willing. Why should we? Uh, so there were really this kind of, if, if they are not ready to do it, then we will not. And now I'm so happy that the Biden administration is so strong on this and takes such a leadership. It's, it's really a good partnership and I'm really hopeful from last week. Thank you, Yita. Unfortunately, we only have about five minutes left. There have been many, many questions uh, raised. Two of them we've already addressed, obviously not in all the detail that the questioners would like. I think one on social justice, one on the role of cities and local uh, actors. Uh, but there are a couple of others that I want to ask you uh, and perhaps give you each one minute to close off and tell us what are the most essential things you think that need to be taken in the next, let's say, in the next year, and in which context. And in that context, I want you to address as well, those of you who, who would like to, Hans van der Lohe has raised an issue about getting to net zero. And he says, what we really need is net negative. Uh, we can't just 
do the minimum, we have to move beyond that. And he's also raised the issue about the Arctic, which is really dramatically melting and, and something really has to be done uh, very quickly there. Then there are a number of other issues, but I think what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, is go back and give each of you a minute, as I said, to identify the most important things. And if you see some brief answers to the questions, then perhaps you could do those. And I'm going to start at the end with Alice. Uh, so Alice, can I start with you first? Sure, thank you. Uh, my takeaway and what I think needs to occur is we need to focus on both reducing emissions just as quickly as we can, but we also need to focus on adaptation and that's particularly for the most vulnerable. If we don't focus on those issues, we will have grave national security, global security threats uh, brewing and we need to be able to do both. So uh, it has to be an equal agenda here and that's what we're hearing from the least developed nations and we need to honor that request. Wonderfully clear and brief, thank you very much. Uh, Nick, can I come to you? Uh, I'll take Alice and add, um, I think our biggest lever this year is finance. We need to address the COVID crisis, but you're orientating the financial system, starting with the multilateral development banks and our own bilateral banks, to not just stop funding fossil, but proactively lean in and help countries build the grids and power stations to go clean and the resilience and the nature. That's incredibly important. Um, and at the same time, we need to plan ahead because it's a decade of delivery, not the decade of setting targets. And so we need to build, start building the transition architecture, MEF 2.0, et cetera, this year coming out of Glasgow, not just wait till next year and after we've collapsed. Thank you very much. On the finance issue, many of the multilateral development banks, of course, are now moving even more actively towards funding greener projects. I think an area where they could be even more active is to encourage countries to stop subsidizing fossil fuels, but that's my own issue, especially with cost low. Um, Jacob, can I come to you now? Uh, absolutely. Well, I mean, I think this would reinforce both what, what Alice and Nick said. I think from the EU perspective, it's it's really rolling out our domestic policies. Um, and, and that's obviously about cutting emissions. It's also about demonstrating how our adaptation strategy can be um, implemented and uh, working on our, our finance as well, uh, not just in terms of development cooperation, but uh, you may have seen we, we rolled out a taxonomy um, just a few days ago, which is aimed at helping investors, whether they're at the household level or at the institutional level, um, to figure out how to distinguish between what, what's green and what isn't, uh, and to take, uh, take the appropriate actions. So I think that all of that is in the context of this new mindset, which is what do you need to do to get to net zero? What kinds of actions do you need to take to get to net zero? Uh, and, and, and hopefully, um, those, those policies will um, be more inspiring than daunting uh, with re regard to other countries that have made um, similar kinds of commitments. And as I said in my opening remarks, we can work together to make sure that they uh, mutually support each other. Thank you very much. And of course, everyone has a role to play here. Even you and I can do something. David, can I come to you, please? Um, well, let, let me first just fully, in, I mean, just fully embrace the comments uh, that have come before. I, I, I really do. I, I mean that. I mean, we, we, there's no such thing here as a U.S. perspective or an EU perspective, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to this. We, I also just fully embrace the notion that we have to just move ahead with any and all solutions we can. We don't have the luxury of being extremely ideological about preferred solutions. Um, we're going to we're, we're going to have to do uh, you know everything and, and let a thousand flowers bloom as long as they're going in the direction of delivering net zero. We may need uh, well we we will need as Secretary Kerry has said negative emissions as well. So don't get me wrong. I mean net zero is not a uh, is is not in any way um, uh, casting aspersions on negative emissions solutions. Uh, we're going to need those as well um, through both natural carbon solutions as well as some of the, you know, hopefully promising direct air capture technologies that need to come further along. But uh, uh, but that starts with you know with action and and investment today. Um, and then uh, you know there was a question as well about trade and climate change. And one thing I would just point to is as someone who's worked in both those different domains. Look at the remarks of um, uh, of 
Ambassador Tai at USTR on this in her recent remarks at the Center for American Progress, I would just say highly refreshing um, to, to see, uh, you know, to borrow Nick's terms, the USTR that, that sees its role as at the forefront of contributing to a whole of government approach on climate, not just being a bystander. Um, and, and I'm very encouraged by that. Do take note, the EU has had a little bit more time to kind of think through this um, uh, than, than the U.S. administration has or that a, a USTR with a new, uh, you know, sort of a, a new um, reinvigoration has. Uh, but I think, I think we'll be getting there. And, and I think we have far more in common and far more to work on together um, than we will have that divides us. Uh, and I think it's very important to keep that general mindset over the, over the, the weeks and the months and, and the years to come. So that's, that's all I would say. Thank you very much. I, I'm sorry we have so little time. Uh, I'm probably going to be fired, but Yuta, I'll give you really- One second. Yeah, <laughs> and we'll end. No, um, many people, I mean, the panel was excellent and we, I heard so many things that I would agree to. I, I, I will brand myself to the sectorial legislation and say that we need also to develop how to do it in the different sectors and the ETS is really important. And I hope that the US will, maybe we could cooperate to do it in a similar way uh, because I, I think that would be extremely helpful for the industry to have predictability. Uh, in the future, and that would also help on the global scale to get more and more ETS uh, reforms or similar things. And I mean, the engineer of the ETS is American, so uh, I, I, I really hope that we could uh, develop and integrate ETS reforms in the world. Great. Thank you so much. Apologies to the organizers for running three minutes over time. Thank you so much to all the panelists and all the participants for the really useful and interesting questions. I hope you will all go back and do everything you possibly can to make sure this now is put into action. Push your politicians, make sure your neighbors buy an electric car, do whatever you can. We are all in this together. And as President Macron says, there's no planet B. So we all have to work together. Thank you so much to all of you. Enjoy the rest of the day. And I hope to see you all again soon in a similar context. Bye-bye.